I think it's it's actually really quite exciting that uh, this is the uh, the evolution of compassion into the workplace, and uh, you know we all think about these interventions get out to just to people, but the power of this actually coming to the workplace where, of course, all of us spend a lot of our time and, in fact, is probably uh, a source of great suffering as well. So I, I think that's really exciting. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Helen Wing. Uh, she is a PhD candidate in the uh, Affective Neuroscience Lab at the University of Wisconsin, working with our friend and colleague, uh, Richie Davidson. <coughs> And she has great interest in how mental training practices, specifically at this point, compassion, have an impact on emotion regulation, uh, utilizing uh, various tools, including functional magnetic resonance imaging and uh, economic measures. Uh, so, Helen. Okay, so I will be talking about the behavioral and neural effects of compassion meditation. So my main research question has been, does compassion meditation training increase helping behavior? And to me, this was a radical idea. You sit on a cushion at home, you do something in your mind, and out in your real life, um, you encounter suffering, and it actually changes your behavior. And I really wanted to test that. So our lab is known for studying compassion experts, and their brains have been shown to respond more empathically to sounds of suffering. But my uh, question dear to my heart is, what about people like you and me? Um, can our emotions and behavior change with just two weeks of practice over the internet? Um, and so that's what we did. We brought people into the lab. Uh, we had them practice over the internet for 30 minutes a day for two weeks, and we saw what happened in, in terms of changing the emotional responses in the brain as well as their behavior. And so I was told we were supposed to talk about some our own personal interest in compassion, and so this is where I'm gonna talk about that. So why compassion for me, and why short interventions? And so I took this uh, question seriously, and I went back to my childhood. This is me around four or five years old. Um, I have this memory of being five or six, and taking the bus home, and thinking to myself, um, if we're just going to die one day, why do we live? What do we do? What do, we do? while we're here, and, I, and, and it's kind of freaky as a, as a young child, and that progressed to its logical conclusion in my teenage years where I had my existential crisis at the age of 15. And it's kind of extreme, but I'm glad I had it early on in life because it um, oriented me into what, I, what I've been doing since then. And so I read some books that helped me answer this question for myself, why am I here, what is my purpose? One of them was The Art of Happiness, and the other by the Dalai Lama, and the other book was Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman. So in The Art of Happiness, um, he talks about the importance of compassion, that everyone wants to be happy, that everyone suffers, and so we should care about them, and that because we're all the same in that way, we can connect in that way. And that helped me immensely in terms of my relationships, in terms of um, connecting with others. And then, um, after my getting an undergraduate degree in neuroscience, I read Destructive Emotions, which is by Daniel Goleman, about a conversation with the Dalai Lama with the, in the Mind and Life Institute, and that's where I read about Richie Davidson's work. So it's these books that got me into grad school. <laughs> Um, so, what is compassion meditation in terms of our study? How do we teach this? And so first, like um, some other studies you've heard about, we start with a loved one. And this is someone you really care about and it's easy to feel compassion for. This is my cat, Elliot, who I really love, but it could be a friend or a family member. Um, and so you actually envision a time when you uh, contemplate a time that they've suffered in their life, and then you practice uh, wishing them relief from that suffering. And we told our participants to use the phrases, may you be free from suffering, may you have joy and ease. We, actually, we also told them to pay attention to their internal bodily sensations and to use a light visualization um, to imagine a golden light going from their heart to the other person's heart to relieve their suffering. And then uh, we had people move on to themselves and wishing themselves compassion, and we just heard about how that can be difficult for some people. 
And then we have them move on to a stranger. So it's even more difficult to wish compassion for someone you don't really know. This is a bus driver. And finally, we have them practice compassion for an actively difficult person in their lives. I don't know if there are any Game of Thrones fans out there, but this is Joffrey Baratheon. He's a pretty evil king. So whoever, that, whoever the Joffrey is in your life, that's who you would practice with. Um, and in our study, we specifically studied the response to strangers, although I think there would be, um, there's really interesting things you could do with each of these uh, types of people. And so as you can see from um, the meditation, it's like strengthening the compassion muscle, uh, going to the increasing weight from cat to Joffrey. <laughs> Um, so what measures does, did we use? Our lab um, tends to really focus on measures that are less susceptible to social desirability. So everyone wants to think of themselves as a compassionate person. If we train them in compassion, they're going to want to tell us that they're more compassionate. And that's important too, but we want to also focus on things where um, um, it's less susceptible to that. And so we looked at altruistic behavior and we used ec economic decision-making measures. One, because it's very easy to measure, it's already in, in uh, numerical units. Another is they are actually spending their own money, so whatever they decide to spend gets taken out of their um, payment. And then we also look at the emotional response in the brain, which we're assuming people um, can't manipulate as easily. And then uh, we also looked at looking time. So how much are people looking at these images of people suffering, which we show them in the scanner? OK, so the general framework um, in this study is that com compassion meditation will increase feelings of compassion, which we will, we will be able to see in terms of changes in the brain. And this will uh, be related to changes in altruistic behavior. So how do we study compassion training? Um, in our study, we used random assignment so that we can make claims that any changes we see are due to compassion training specifically and not just the passage of time. So we randomized people to either a, the compassion um, training condition or a cognitive reappraisal training condition. And I won't talk too much about that, but in that condition, people learned how to uh, reinterpret negative events in their life to feel less stressed. So we measured uh, their brain responses before and after the training, and we showed them Im uh, pictures of people suffering and asked them to evoke feelings of compassion. And the reappraisal group were asked to uh, reinterpret the meaning of the images. Then we measured the altruistic behavior only after training because we didn't want people to know that we um, were measuring them on helping behavior, and so we actually had them sign a separate consent form, so they thought it was a completely different study. We thought if we measured both before and after, they would get clued in to that was an important measure for the study. And then we looked at looking time, both before and after training. Um, so first I'll explain our, our behavioral measure. So how did we measure compassionate behavior? Um, so in, in this framework, we define compassion as the feeling of caring for and wanting to help those who are suffering. So whatever task we designed needed to involve an element of witnessing suffering and then an opportunity to help someone and um, behave altruistically. So we came up with something called the redistribution game. And there are three players in this game. I will use Richie as player one. This is Drew Fox, my collaborator, as player B and uh, I'll be player C, and, we, and player C is the person we're studying. So in this game, player A gets $10, and player B has $0, and, the, and player C has $5. In the first move of the game, player A decides how much to share with player B. In this case, where she was very unfair, only sharing one out of $10. Uh, player C watches this interaction and can decide to spend some of her own money and for every dollar she spends, it takes away $2 from player A and redistributes it to player B. So we call this the redistribution game, and that's our metric of altruistic behavior. And you can think of this behavior kind of like Robin Hood stealing from the richie to give to the poor. Uh, sorry, he's not here, I can do it. Um, 
Uh, so that game was very interactive, all those faces, but the way um, in the lab to have a lot of scientific control is we used um, anonymous computer interaction. So all the, player, all the participants saw was participant one made his or her decision and transferred 10 points or $1 to participant two. How do you want to divide up your points? So it's very cut and dried, only mathematical language, nothing about compassion and suffering. Um, so we had... Um, we brought 140 people into the lab. These are people with no compassion training, um, and we just had them free play. They played with each other. They actually played in the same room together. And we found that the people who scored the highest on a compassion scale that they filled out are the people who gave the most in the redistribution game. And this was our way of validating that this um, task was related to compassion. So our first question was, um, we train people in compassion for two weeks. Do they actually behave more altruistically? And so what we see here is um, we had to adjust for something called social desirability, and we measured that using a scale. And after we accounted for that, what we found is that the people that we brought in for a separate study who had no training um, gave money in the game. Um, but then for the reappraisal group, who had two weeks of reappraisal, they showed no difference from the, the people with no training. So that showed two weeks of reappraisal does not affect helping behavior. However, the compassion group showed a significant increase from the group with no training, so we can assume that the compassion group is increasing in their behavior, and they also showed a significant increase compared to the control group. So it was specific to compassion training and not just any training at all. So then our next question is, can this change in behavior be explained by changes in the brain? So again, we measured um, brain responses both before and after training. We showed them uh, pictures of people suffering. I'm going to quickly flash it. I know it's distressing. Um, and then we, we associated these changes in the brain with the behavioral measure. And the general, so I'm going to be talking about a bunch of different uh, brain regions. You don't have to memorize all of that or worry about all of that, but the general principle is that greater altruistic behavior in the redistribution game is predicted by changes in the brain. And so one of the most robust findings we found are increases in a region of the parietal cortex. And this region, I think, is involved in the act of witnessing suffering. So one part of compassion training is I think that people are becoming more open, more engaged with other people's suffering. Um, so this region has been implicated in emotion sharing and the mirror neuron system. So it's, um, it helps people to understand the feelings of others through a more kind of bottom-up feeling sharing way. But if you're, if you're sharing more feelings, then you're kind of in trouble. What do you do with those feelings? So another region we found was in the prefrontal cortex, which has been implicated in emotion regulation and self-control. And so we think this region is being recruited to help regulate some of the emotions being evoked by being more open to other people's suffering. And so the general idea is that the more uh, the brain activity has increased from before to after training, the more people gave in the redistribution game. And this, these findings line up well with... Um, I, ha I had the fortunate experience of being able to talk about my work with His Holiness the Dalai Lama just a few months ago, um, and I talked to him about the study, and he, he uh, thought about it in terms of effort, what he called effortful compassion, because these people are just beginning to learn their normal response is probably not um, pure compassion. Uh, we actually use these stimuli a lot in emotion research to evoke very negative emotions and distress, and so we think the um, people are initially responding with distress, but, but they have to effortfully practice compassion to transform that response into something more caring and more pro-social. Uh, people were talking about the threat systems, and so uh, the amygdala has been known to be, be involved in feelings of distress, feelings of fear, feelings of arousal, and we find that the more people are able to decrease their amygdala response in, in response to other people's suffering, the more they end up giving in the redistribution game. So we think one, one emotion that's getting regulated is the personal d distress associated with being open to other people's suffering. Um, then we looked at some other regions involved in emotion, uh, looking at brain connectivity, and one region 
we focused on was the anterior insula, which has been implicated in studies of empathy and also paying attention to bodily sensations. So um, the more the prefrontal cortex is connected to the insula, the more people are giving in this game. We also looked at the nucleus accumbens, which has, in, has been involved in reward systems, in charitable donations, and we found the more the prefrontal cortex is connected to the nucleus accumbens, um, the more people give in this game. Uh, so finally, we looked at um, their behavior in terms of where they're looking with their eyes. So if they're more engaged with people's suffering, they should actually be looking longer at the parts of the image where people are suffering. So we took images like this, I'm sorry again, I apologize, and we drew a box around the most emotional part of the image, and then we calculated how much time people were looking in the most emotional parts. And what we found, this is after training now, but uh, the compassion group is looking longer at the images of suffering compared to the images of non-suffering, just people at work or walking down the street. Whereas in the reappraisal group, they're looking longer at the pictures, um, the neutral pictures compared to the negative pictures. And so this suggests people are, are actually visually engaging more with the suffering. But what does that really mean? So again, I, I associated this, vi this um, looking behavior with the game, just in the compassion group. And you can see uh, people range from looking a lot more at suffering compared to non-suffering. And there are also people who are looking more at non-suffering than suffering. And so I ca I ca um I took these two groups, people who look more at suffering than non-suffering compared to the opposite, and what I found is that people who are more willing to look at suffering are the, also the ones that were more pro-social in this game. And so the conclusions from this study is that we do think compassion meditation is increasing compassion, and that this affects brain activity, also looking behavior, and that this leads to increased altruistic behavior in a totally separate context when they're not even meditating. And I, I forgot to um, focus on the fact that this was administered purely over the internet. There was no formal training. And although I don't think it's the most robust way to learn compassion, there's um, a lot of implications for, for how accessible and available this could be to anyone with an internet connection. So I'm really excited about that. So thank you all for listening, and thanks for everyone involved. This kind of work takes a lot of work. Um, and thanks, thanks a lot.